Hey there! Thank you for tuning into Duck Bricks, and welcome to a brand new episode of Bionicle Retold, where I recap the events of the Bionicle universe from beginning to the end in chronological order. Just in case this is your first video, I'd advise you to go and check out the prologue first because this is a direct continuation of that storyline. If you didn't watch the prologue already, you may be a little bit confused as to where we are, although I will do a bit of a fun recap to start things off. Now I do want to preface this, this is basically a series where I've been retelling the entire Bionicle story chronologically. So first of all, major spoiler warning, if you actually want to consume the Bionicle story the way it was meant to be told, I would highly advise you to check out another one of my videos where I explain how to actually get started with the universe if you don't want to get spoiled. This is more of a general overview where I explain everything again from beginning to end. So some major plot points and story beats that were big payoffs and mysteries throughout the entire theme's run are just going to be spoiled and already were spoiled by the prologue. So that's your first warning now. The second thing is that this episode in particular, Chapter 1, Beginnings, is going to go over a lot of really expository detail, a lot of just information we gotta get out of the way to actually start to understand this world. So just a fair warning that this episode probably won't be one of the ones that's more like a story. It'll probably read more like a legend or maybe some sort of a guidebook on Bionicle where I just explain all of the basics behind the Matoran universe before we can actually dive into the main story. But so without further ado, let's just dive right into the show. Starting up right now is a recap of last time's prologue, The Core War. Extinction! Thousands of light years away, battles rage across a planet known as Spherus Magna over energized protodermis, a mysterious and powerful substance with the ability to create or destroy. Elemental tribes clash, unaware that the planet is nearing destruction with the mining of this substance. Scientist kings known as great beings devise a last-ditch attempt at survival, sending a colossal robot hurtling into deep space. Its mission, to survey and collect data on other worlds, societies, and technologies, with the hopes of returning after thousands of years to repair the planet. As this great spirit robot launches from the planet's surface, the war for Protodermis splits the planet in three chunks, forever altering the future of society. The fate of Spherus Magna and all its inhabitants lies in the hands of a burgeoning species created at the heart of the Great Spirit Robot, only just beginning to seek out their own place in the world. This is Bionicle Retold. Chapter 1, Beginnings We last left off with the Great Spirit Robot hurtling into space, carrying a new hybrid species aboard called the Matoran. In the Matoran language, Great Spirit translates to Mata Nui, and at this stage in the universe, to its inhabitants, the Great Spirit Robot was known as just Mata Nui. This microcosm of a universe served as the primary mystery driving eight years of the Bionicle storyline from 2001 to 2008. As you may probably guess, this was the big mystery yet to be unveiled until eight years into the LEGO theme, that literally everything was happening inside a gigantic robot. But to truly delve deep into this brave new world, we have to turn back the clock, returning to the time before Spherus Magna was split apart and the great beings were still working to develop and build this Mata Nui robot. It was at this time that the robot was divided into multiple internal domes, separated by a sea of liquid protodermis that, in essence, was the lifeblood of the robot. With internal gravity systems keeping everything secure and in place, vast continents began to slowly take shape, with artificial weather beginning to kick in to climate control each island within the robot. This robot had a very precise system of surveying alien worlds. Upon arrival on a new planet, the robot would land and lay horizontally, submerged in the oceans of the world. Across the face of the robot, a highly specialized cloaking mechanism would take place, disguising itself as a remote island amidst the ocean. When the analysis was completed and surveying was done, mechanical swarm-like robots known as the Borok Swarms would wipe across the face of the robot, 
clearing away the camouflage and preparing it for takeoff yet again. Aided by a remote satellite known as the Red Star to calculate trajectory and conduct repairs, the surveillance process was truly state-of-the-art. The very first species created by the great beings were known as the Matoran, hardy builders and workers similar in size and ability to the Agori. Unbeknownst to the rest of the great beings, they had gained full sentience and free will thanks to the meddling of the great being Velika, who also transferred his consciousness into a Matoran body to keep an eye on the universe and influence the development of society. Much like the Agori and Glatorian, the Matoran were also separated into elements, although this time, unlike the inhabitants of Spherus Magna, they were built to possess some innate elemental abilities. To perform the vast degree of functions and roles in the Matoran universe, 15 elements were chosen for Matoran to be divided into. Fire, water, air, ice, stone, earth, light, magnetism, lightning, plasma, gravity, sonics, the green, iron, and psionics. I just want to note that out of these 15 elements, I know it sounds like a lot, but really only 7 and arguably 6 are really too too relevant to the main storyline. The other ones just play supporting roles. You can probably guess which ones are the most important, and I'll be going over them later in this video. And the other thing I wanted to note is that the Batoran have their own language. They basically have their own dialect separate to the English language where a lot of words in English translate directly into Matoran universe words. A key proponent of this language is the use of suffixes and prefixes as well. So for example, the prefix ta means fire. So a Matoran of fire would be a ta Matoran. A village of fire would be ta koro with koro meaning village. A region of fire would be ta wahi with wahi meaning region and so on. And don't worry if this is a little bit confusing, I've linked dictionaries down in the description below, and I'll also be explaining every single word as they come along in the stories. So don't worry about getting too too confused because I will be explaining every single word I say. Just keep in mind that if I say the word Matoran and have some prefix behind it, then that necessarily means that element. So Ga Matoran water, Le Matoran air, and so on. The first Matoran ever brought into being were the Matoran of Light, or Av Matoran. It was their job to maintain and power the heart of the Great Spirit Robot, and as such, were equipped with minor elemental light abilities to ensure the power source of the robot remains stable. Situated in the realm of Karda Nui, the world that feeds the world, these Av Matoran were the first to work amongst the Matoran universe and sustain its artificial heart. Upon reaching the end of their life cycles, or if needed, Av Matoran could be forcibly evolved and transformed into the Borok robots created to cleanse the surface of the robot, losing their personality and memories in favor of a singular will to cleanse. Remember this for a future chapter. You may be able to guess where this is going, but a swarm of mindless robots with one core directive to cleanse the surface of Mata Nui would prove to be, let's just say, problematic in the future story. Core to the functions of the Great Spirit Robot were the Kanohi Masks, highly advanced technological objects that granted powers and abilities to any Matoran who wore them. Initially created by the Great Beings, these masks represented an additional secondary power boost in addition to the wearer's primary element. There are four major types of Kanohi power levels, Powerless, Noble, Great, and Legendary. Yes, these were the collectibles of the LEGO theme you gotta have them in any original action-adventure theme LEGO puts out. Powerless masks are worn by every member of the Matoran species, and essentially served as power sources of the Matoran. Despite being unable to access the secondary power the mask would normally provide, without a Kanohi mask, Matoran lapse into a comatose state. There would also be some extraordinary Kanohi that possess powers far beyond a normal mask known as legendary masks. Only three exist. The Kanohi Vahi, the Mask of Time, the Kanohi Ignika, the Mask of Life, and the Mask of Creation, whose true name has been lost to time. These masks cannot be worn by ordinary users and often require special circumstances for their power to be accessed. These were planned to be brought into existence by the great beings to fulfill extremely specific and incredibly powerful duties. The Vahi could be used to slow time around a specific segment of the universe, allowing for quick repairs before major damage was dealt to the robot. The Mask of Creation allows its user to imagine a completed product from raw materials and learn how to construct it or make it out of thin air if it was already envisioned. And finally, arguably the most important of all, the Ignika Mask of Life, 
was only to be used in the most dire of emergency situations. Should the power source of the Great Spirit robot ever falter, the Ignika could be warned by an inhabitant of the Matoran universe to kickstart it back to life, sacrificing that inhabitant in the process. This mask also had an incredibly dangerous and powerful failsafe. Should the advanced AI of the mask deem the Matoran universe and in turn the Great Spirit robot as a whole beyond saving, it would activate a death countdown instantly killing every inhabitant of the universe at once to prevent the technology of the great beings from falling into the wrong hands. Meanwhile, seeing the success of the Avmatoran, the great beings brought forth many more Matoran to populate the land, each imbued with innate elemental abilities that can manifest in a weak manner to perform certain tasks. The main six that continually crop up in the story were Ta Matoran, Matoran of Fire who could tolerate extreme heat and work in intense conditions, Ga Matoran, Matoran of Water who could hold their breath for a long period of time and could repair any water damage to the robot, Le Matoran, Matoran of Air with great ability and speed in tall structures, Ko Matoran, Matoran of Ice that tolerate immense cold and could repair breaches from the vacuum of space, Po Matoran, Matoran of Stone with incredible strength and physical prowess for the heavy lifting jobs of the universe, and Onu Matoran. Matoran of Earth with night vision and enhanced strength to toil in the darkest parts of the universe. After the creation of the Matoran, the great beings created two kindred beings to serve diametrically opposed roles. Artaka, who ruled over a land of the best Matoran crafters and builders who churned out rare artifacts and powerful tools to aid the universe, and Karzani, the ruler of a realm where broken and malfunctioning Matoran were sent to be repaired. While both started with noble intent, Velika's meddling gave all members of the universe sentience, not just the Matoran, and as time progressed, some of these realms devolved into stuff much, much darker. Immediately after their creation, the great beings pitted Artaka and Karzani against each other in a competition to earn the legendary Mask of Creation. Artaka eventually emerged the victor after months of battle, claiming the mask and leaving his counterpart, Karzani, with the Kanohi Olisi, the Great Mask of Alternate Futures. This left Artaka with the power to create literally anything he wanted, and Karzani with the power to inflict visions of alternate futures on his subjects. Still a cool power, but not literally create anything you want cool. You can understand why Karzani may be a little jealous of his brother. Due to the sentience Velika bestowed upon the members of the Matoran universe, Karzani grew deeply resentful of Artaka and slowly began his descent into darkness. Meanwhile, the great beings continued to experiment and create. In an attempt to gain full expertise over creating purely organic materials, something they had first attempted with Tren Krom, the great beings inadvertently unleashed twisted and hideous lizard-like creatures known as the Zyglak onto the Matoran universe. Escaping from the labs of the great beings, the Zyglak embodied an evil nature in true opposition to the Matoran, significantly impacting worker productivity as they rampaged across the insides of the robot. And so, with a new threat on the horizon, the great beings decided to create a protecting force to defend the Matoran against evil and violence. It was in these early days of prehistory that the Hand of Artaka was formed, featuring an array of defensive soldiers such as the mighty Axon and weapons master Hydraxon. Operating from the realm of Artaka, this group soon exemplified principles of justice and courage, again thanks to Velika giving each inhabitant free will to develop their own moral code. With the Zyglek held at bay by the hand of Artaka, the great beings could refocus on further development of the universe. And so, a city of legends was born. Rising from the central head of the great spirit robot, the city of Metru Nui was, quite literally, the brain of the universe a focal point where all knowledge was processed, archived, and analyzed by the dutiful Matoran kept inside. It was then that the great beings sought to improve and evolve the Matoran species, allowing the most noble and good of their kind to undergo a transformative process to evolve them into warriors and protectors known as Toa. Should any threats endanger the Matoran, particularly those living in Metru Nui, chosen Matoran could rise to the title of hero and gain physical strength full control over their elemental abilities, and have their powerless Kanohi masks upgraded to great Kanohi masks, giving them a wide range of secondary powers for each new Kanohi. And with Toa representing the second cycle of Matoran evolution, the third and final cycle was also created, known as Turaga. After a Toa fulfills his or her duties, they can choose to surrender their power and become Turaga, 
transitioning from warriors to elders with an active hand in guiding Matoran society and instilling values of peace and justice in the Matoran, raising the next generation of Toa heroes. Speaking of Toa, the first Toa ever created was Helrix. Hailing from the land of Artaka, Helrix was a female Toa of Water sent to Metru Nui to assist the Matoran in its construction and beat back any Zyglek that attempted to breach the city gates. To further fortify and defend the central processing city, the great beings gave life to a new subset of species known as Rahi, animals of limited intelligence to inhabit the lands and act as a natural defense against invaders. Some of the first Rahi were sea creatures of vast proportions, ancient during the time where Metru Nui was still being built, inhabiting the depths of the Silver Sea of Protodermis around the city. And finally, as Metru Nui neared completion, the Matoran universe was complete at last. From the brain of the robot housing Metru Nui, to the heart and power source of Karda Nui, and to even southern islands at the legs and arms of the robot, Matoran and Toa colonized these individual islands, forming a home across the entirety of the Great Spirit robot. At this pivotal point in history, the great beings undertook their last creation and forged the Kanohi Ignika, the Mask of Life. Heated by undying fires and cooled in caverns of ice, the Mask of Life housed the power over all life in the universe, and its fate could shape the destiny of all the great beings' creations. As the Matoran labeled throughout the universe, two great beings brought the Ignika down to the southern continent, where they hid it in secret on an island known as Voya Nui, where it was preserved safely for many ages beneath the volcano Mount Valmai, guarded by a new being named Umbra, waiting for its destined wearer to arrive and for its own destiny to be fulfilled. It was with this final act of creation that the great beings completed the universe they had begun and departed, perhaps forever. All, except of course, Velika, who continued to masquerade as a Matoran to influence the development of a species he considered he had the right to rule. And as the great beings departed the universe, they kick-started the dormant AI of Mata Nui to govern the entire universe in their stead. Awakening, the great spirit Mata Nui assumed control of the robot and directed it to depart Spherus Magna, right at the brink of the shattering and bringing us back to where we left off at the end of the prologue. As Mata Nui flew deep into space, beginning the great work of categorizing and gathering data on other worlds and species, members of the universe began to diverge from their loops, developing their own personalities and motivations. In these early days of the burgeoning universe, the Matoran labored in darkness and lived in sorrow. The best among them were sent to the realm of Artaka. Known as the Great Refuge, this was a glorious place to work safely and happily in the light. The damaged and malfunctioning Matoran were sent to Karzani, whose original purpose was to repair the Matoran and send them back better than before. But the realm of Karzani was a harsh and unforgiving place, and without the governing hand and supervision of the great beings, Karzani soon realized he was ill-equipped to repair the Matoran on his own. Instead, any attempt he made to rebuild the Matoran resulted in them being reshaped into weaker and more misshapen forms than the ones they arrived in, and giving them weapons to compensate. In his shame, Karzani began to send these poorly rebuilt Matoran to live in seclusion on the southern continent. As Turaga all across the Matoran universe began to realize that no Matoran sent to Karzani ever returned, they barred off all paths to his land, further driving Karzani into a rage and twisting his mind. As the years passed, Karzani became bitter and angry, blaming the Matoran for his failures, deluding himself into thinking that they were not destined to be repaired. Karzani then held captive what Matoran he had left, enslaving them and subjugating them to grotesque experiments in order to fortify his own realm for his now sinister purposes, and awaiting any stray Matoran who may wander into his traps. A passage from Bionicle books describing the realm of Karzani describe it as a place where fire provides no warmth while the touch of ice burns. Dust falls cascade over mountains while pools of water sit unmoving. Thunder makes no noise, but the sound of a gentle breeze can be deafening. This is a realm of shadow, of famine, plague, and blight. A world of darkness where there is no place for light, and the ground screams at your very steps. In case it wasn't already obvious, the realms of Artaka and Karzani are basically the bionicle equivalent of heaven and hell, where the good Matoran are sent to Artaka to work in peace, and the bad ones who do not perform their jobs correctly are sent to Karzani, basically hell. 
In fact, it was a common insult for Matoran to use against each other, go to Karzani, if it wasn't clear enough. During this time of upheaval, the growing numbers of Toa soon rendered the Hand of Artaka obsolete, with many of its members splitting off to form their own organization dedicated to carrying out the will of Mata Nui. This new secret society known as the Order of Mata Nui began to operate in secret, keeping a watchful eye over the Matoran universe. To publicly maintain order, Mata Nui also brought a powerful new race of beings known as the Makuta to existence. Joining together into the Brotherhood of Makuta, these new beings had the important role of creating new Rahi in the absence of the great beings to perform unique tasks and aid the Matoran, resulting in a massive rise of diverse new species as these Makuta experimented with viruses, organic material, and liquid protodermis itself to create beasts of burden, laborers, repairers, and more. With the city of Metru Nui completed, it was the Brotherhood of Makuta's primary job to protect the city against any and all threats alongside the Toa, both with the creation of Rahi beasts bred for battle and defense, and by upgrading their own bodies to make them suitable for war individually. And finally, the first alliance of Toa into a cohesive team was then made, a tradition that would endure for the rest of history, and the first Toa canisters were built by the Matoran as a primary means of transport for the Toa. If the Toa canisters look familiar, it's because they literally were the packaging that the toys came in. Pretty cool brand story integration if I do say so myself. Despite the rise of more Toa and the Brotherhood of Makuta, the Zyglak continued to pose a major threat to the Matoran and Toa, and in a critical moment, the leader of the first Toa team, Lesovic, hesitated, and as a result, his entire team was killed by Zyglak. Guilt-ridden, Lesofik deserted his post and began to explore the universe without a purpose. In spite of this failure, the Order of Mata Nui partnered with Artaka to create six elite Toa, physical embodiments of six main elements, and unique by the fact that they had never been Matoran. Due to the power of Artaka's mask of creation, they came into being as Toa. They were Tahu, Toa of Fire, Gali, Toa of Water, Liwa, Toa of Air, Kopaka, Toa of Ice, Pohatu, Toa of Stone, and Onua, Toa of Earth. Remember their names, for they would grow to become the central characters in Bionicle lore. For hundreds of years, this elite team of Toa Mata, named after Mata Nui himself, protected the heart of the robot and defended Karta Nui against any and all threats. During their active duty in Karta Nui, the Toa Mata were trained by Weapons Master Hydraxon, now senior member of the Order of Mata Nui, in preparation of their ultimate destiny. Impatient of their endless training and yearning to learn more of their intended purpose, Tahu, leader of the team, along with Kopaka, sought out Helrix, the first Toa, demanding to be told a reason for their existence. Helrix then finally revealed to them their crucial purpose, telling them of the mysterious Kodrex, a giant silver sphere created by the great beings in Karta Nui where their journey would begin. It was there that Tahu and Kopaka learned of the team's true purpose. Should Mata Nui ever succumb to external attacks or even be overthrown from within, they would automatically awaken, jettisoning from their Toa canisters and fueling the Kodrax with their elemental energies, restoring Mata Nui and saving the Matoran universe. And so, when they were adequately trained and it came time for the Toa Mata to achieve their destiny, they were sent deep into the Kodrex and placed in stasis inside special Toa canisters, designed to sustain life functions but keep them asleep, ready to be summoned in time of crisis. And after this failsafe was put in place, the beings called the Barag Twins, queens of the Borok Swarms, were brought into creation and sent into slumber alongside the Borok Swarms, awaiting the time of their awakening, just like the Toa Mata. But little did this brand new universe know, storms were brewing, and major internal conflict was about to strike, kickstarting some of the most pivotal moments that plunged the universe into conflict and changed the course of the great spirit robot forever. But that's all for next time, and with two major failsafes deep in stasis and the Matoran universe well on its way to being fully developed, thus ends Chapter 1, Beginnings. Tune in next time for the continuation of this story in Chapter 2, Rise of the Brotherhood. Alright, and with that, that about sums up Chapter 1, Beginnings of Bionicle Retold, 
Let me know down in the comments below if you are a new viewer. Did you enjoy this? Do you have any questions remaining? Feel free to ask any lore-related questions in the chat, and hopefully myself or maybe someone else watching this who already is familiar with Bionicle will be able to help you out. As always, I try to make these as clear as possible, so please let me know if anything is still confusing, and I will try to address it in the comments below and pin that comment. But with that, let's wrap this up. Thank you so much for tuning in, and stay tuned to this channel for even more Bionicle Retold episodes and more LEGO and Bionicle news, reviews, discussion, and analyses coming your way very soon. Thank you so much, and bye-bye for now.